Yes, I can. Uh, let's see, what do I have to push to let you see me? Uh, there's a little icon um, that looks like a little camera. That one? Yep. Does that do it? Yes, I can see you. Okay, great. Yeah. I know that we've had quite a few conversations uh, over the past few months about the dialectics and your role there and... Um, you know, I've, I've read a lot about your, your thoughts about what happened and, and things like that. And I know that we're pretty much on the same page when it comes to uh, gender and, and some of the experiences we've both had, myself as a musician and curator and yourself as an artist. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I know that you were um, invited to participate by Dr. Joseph Burke, um, yes. uh, someone who I've worked with on previous events uh, here in London. And so when he first reached out to you um, to get you involved... Um, what really drew you to being a, oh. being a part of the Dialectics Congress? You know, what really made it for you or what really sparked your interest originally? Well, the larger issues, the social construction of um, participation, self-definition, radicalization, which was what the Dialectics represented to me. Um, it's only how many years ago was that? It will be 50 years next year. 50 years. So that's a lifetime. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've got 50 years to readdress and reconsider my experience there of marginalization and trivialization and resentment and resistance in the configuration that surrounded Dr. Burke, surrounding Joe for inviting me, that he within his own cohorts had... Um, an odd radicality in accepting this young woman artist to participate and to comment, mm -hmm. in effect to extract their own material and feed it back to them, which was an authority that was, I think that was what was partly what was so resented. But looking back on this, um, I see that it gave us the opportunity to reassess the degree of um, fragmentation that the larger social issues proposed and did not uh, integrate. And, and, do you, and do you feel that if you were invited, I know you've been invited back in a sense to this event, but if yeah. Joe and all the original participants we're planning the event again, and you going through the experience that you did, would you still be involved? No, no. I couldn't imagine uh, a re-involvement because the tensions and structures that were in that history have not deeply transformed themselves. They're not that different. Um, so if it was a conference with the same premises overtly, of um, the original dialectics and it was all structured by feminists, I would definitely participate. Um, one of the things that uh, feminist analysis allowed was to completely reanalyze and reposition the degree to which masculine culture was actually inflexible even in its uh, invitations and aspects of having female participation. It was all done through uh, traditions of um, inequity and authority. Because I know that you, you mentioned that, um, you know, the men involved, the other participants involved, um, validated each other's, other's works, and you said that they mythicized the female as an auxiliary and an adjacent uh, to the male. Um, and so when you took part in, I know that you had a screening of fuses and you also had a happening, you know, you did a, a performance at the Roundhouse as well. Sweet. So how much did you, is that your cat there? <laughs> is it, she's drinking my coffee and oh. she's messing up the computer. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in that way, um, you know, how did your actual performance at the event incorporate all these feelings and emotions and curveballs that were thrown at you? Well, I wasn't concentrating on what was thrown at me. I was concentrating on what they were saying to each other. Do we have a cat in this now? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> oh. 
What's your cat called? Oh. Her name is La Nina. La Nina, that's a beautiful name. Yeah, well, she was so assertive as a kitten, as a baby, that I thought it must be a boy, and she was originally named El Nino. Right. Uh, she's the most expressive, smart, um, self-defined, comprehending little animal. But then I took her to the vet for her shots, and I said, look, her little balls aren't growing. <laughs> and the vet said, well, it's La Nina, it's not El Nino. Right. Yeah, so she's one of seven sisters who all have marvelous homes from a stray cat that my assistant saved. Oh, that's lovely. What yeah. a lovely story. And it sounds so, like she's got some of your spirit as well. She's an incredible animal. She makes artworks of a cat sort. Oh, As wow. a bunch, scatter pieces. And she's not watching me work. It's just in her... Uh, awareness of material. I mean, she'll carry things from room to room and recompose them. Wow, that's amazing. Do you think she'll have her own exhibition one day? Well, now she's working on uh, being a hunter, so there would be a lot of dead birds. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lovely. Maybe you could do a taxidermy type theme or, or something <laughs> like that. Um, so, well, she's more than invited and welcome along to the Skype uh, call that we're having today, so that's fantastic. Um, another thing that I wanted to touch upon is a um, really interesting quote that you said when we, we had a conversation a few months ago where you said that the male participants, their idealizations and their areas of suppressing content and participation really created this political energy that was very masculine, masculinized when it came to the Dialectics Congress. Um, yes. You know, the dialectics had to be this big, masculine, domineering sort of event yeah. Um, and so in light of that, um, how do you feel that current discussions of political and social ide ideologies have changed? Have they changed in terms of the attitude or the angle in which people discuss them? Or do you still find they are, you know, constructed under these sort of male dominant um, angles, really? Well, our political, social, militaristic system remains highly... Uh, Macho, masculinized, it's in the old Greek tradition of male domination. But the issues within the culture are shifting, have shifted in 50 years so radically. Our issues now have to do with gender transformation, with Black Lives Matter, uh, a huge movement here in the States, which is um, pretty much instigated by the women, the black women who are involved in it grassroots movement. Um, feminist theory has transformed everything. Language, science, etymology, gardening. So that's opened a threshold where there's an acceptance of, um, of male radicalization that's different from the militaristic traditions. It's a radicalization that has to do with ecology and gender and uh, caring for what's alive. Although we're not doing very well, the refugee crisis is a nightmare. The ecology um, crisis just has an amazing set of repercussions. It, it's, it, seems that, it seems that our destructive dynamics have really outpaced the proportion of um, readdressing that. And so if you, were, if you were doing a call to action um, for both men and women to sort of get involved in some of these issues that you've mentioned, the migrant crisis, Black Lives Matter, still gender and gender transformation, what, would, what do you think people nowadays should be aware of or what practical things could they do to address these issues? I think they should be fighting for rights in Gaza. That's my largest uh, political area of uh, dissimilitude, of uh, chaos and betrayal of potential kinds of um, equity and fairness in social organization. And then to come to our own cities, I don't know, I don't know, D, it's endless. Where would you start? You're starting right here with the reappraisal, examining dialectics of liberation. Uh, one of the things I could say about the intense masculinization of that time was that it was so so pinpointed, you know, it was kind of uh, focused. 
and had a self-definition that is not possible right now. We're all over the place. You know, our wor worlds have all imploded, and what isn't imploded is occluded, it's hidden. We're still struggling with powers that are not uh, clear. Yeah. yeah. So. And um, in, in regards to that, so if you were actually um, yourself putting together a, something similar to the dialectics, or as you mentioned earlier, you would uh, maybe take part if it was run by women or by feminists who were coming together to stage a similar event. So if you were um, you know, on the curatorial side of things, who would you pick to, to come and have a platform and, and to you know, be a part of the dialogue with you if you were in charge of selecting some women to join you? Um, well, the women from India, those activists are incredibly eloquent. And I'm not going to remember their names. Who are they that come to mind to you? They're you um, is, it, is it the Hijaras, the Hijara community, which um, are the well, transgender community in India that uh, of late have a you know a really gaining activism in terms of trying to change the laws there? Yes, absolutely. And the women. Um, also, the women that came together after the. I think it was in 2012 where there was that young student who was gang raped in Delhi and, and brutally murdered. And that yes. really caused a wave of activism in terms of women, um, you know, uh, talking about rape and, and sexual crime in India, uh, which was to an unprecedented scale. No one had really seen that before, hundreds of thousands of women marching. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, in such a tragic case, there was a lot of you know, positive action that, that came out of it. But there are thousands of thousands of cases like that that are hidden yeah. all, all over the world. The women who are... Um, have formed their arm, their own army. Oh, I'm not. I'm going to have to remember this later today. Um, it's in Turkey, the north of Turkey. It's one of the um, areas that's being assaulted and bombarded and undermined, and it's um, a separatist group. But that's a very, very interesting and powerful configuration where they've they're they've taken up arms and um, they're controlling to the extent that is possible, the invasion and destruction mm -hmm. of the um, lives around them. Oh, and here, uh, Ananda, is her name Ananda Gaza? I did write her, uh, the Indian scholar. She's just so eloquent and powerful. Uh, I didn't write Naomi Wolf. She's utterly clear and uh, relentlessly going into the most difficult, largest issues. Who am I reading? Well, there's really many. Yeah. And, and it's the fact that so many women are coming up out of their particular grassroots situation. So Black Lives Matter, the women are active in any, every major city in the States now. Um, but we still have these kind of monster fundamentalists controlling male politicians who want to uh, deprive us of the rights over our own bodies, of proper wages, of available work, of housing, of clean water. So what happens in struggling countries is also happening in this overinflated country of ours here. Yeah, it's strange. It is, and again, very similar parallels with the UK, um, you know, where we have a, a, you know, our parliament is, is mostly run by white upper class men um, who fail to really understand the grievances of the community that they represent. Um, right. I have noticed, I think, probably around 2010, 2011, when we started seeing the Arab Springs, where, you know, people were taken to the streets in Egypt, Bahrain, Jordan, and there was a wave of real political activist, activity and uprising in countries that were, you know, hugely suppressed dem dem democratically. Um, yeah. And I think even then I started to see people of my own age becoming more engaged in politics. It was, you know, it was cool to talk about politics or to show that you were an activist. Um, so I think, you know, that has now transpired into lots of different other groups forming and, and people really... Um, not only being activists to one cause, but being a multi-activist, which I've seen a lot of. So 
you know, people who will go and represent and, and go to strikes made by, you know, workers. And they'll also go to a Black Lives Matter meeting and also come to a feminist. So it's great to see that crossover for those who are active. They're very active. Um, so that's something I have noticed in the last few years. Yeah, and it's all connected, so that makes sense. Instead yes. of, uh, you have to concentrate on what's in front of you, but to the extent that that's a fragmentation, it's important to expand our group configurations insofar as that can still be efficient. And starting in very small ways, sometimes it's just opening uh, a space for people to come and read or discuss or experience art or music or something that's always been denied them so that your consciousness is in motion um, and of course that's what your conference is going to provide is um, envisioning social foundations that are activist and possible what you can work with because the forces to deny or suppress this are so huge uh, you have to remark on all the writers, there's a great number of them who are being imprisoned and killed and uh, refuse participation in their cultures. There's, there's just a lot of activists who disappear and are uh, done away with across the board in every culture we can imagine. You know, the Egyptians have just, uh, what did they do, just hung a writer, a poet, mm -hmm. who was critical. Yeah. So it's very, I mean, in terms of, um, you know, looking ahead and, you know, we've, we've reached almost the 50 year mark next year, 2017 will be 50 years since the Congress. So in the next 50 years, what would you like to see? I know that we've discussed, um, you know, calls to action and how people could start things in terms of a grassroots movement, in terms of even opening up a space or, or meeting regularly. But what would you really like to see change in the next 50 years? It's all, all I would like to see, see the, the suppression of all our indulgent capitalist habits. I would like to see less automobiles, less fuel being used, less um, unconscious righteousness about how to work with others in your community. Uh, less divisiveness, of course. But these are things we have to build on from many multiple sources. And, and a lot of the sources that I see as corrective are also in conflict with each other. Um, I don't see a way. I would like to be able to do my own work and to see if that can carry some kind of clarity, even in its very specific small, contradictory way, yeah. And speaking about your work, I know that you're, you know, very active as an artist in terms of your, uh, you know, output. So what do you have planned for 2016? You know, what projects or exhibitions are you currently working on? Oh, well, I'm going to, it's good. I'm going to have a major solo exhibit with two galleries, two very good activist galleries in New York City in October, the long in PPOW. Uh, I'm also going to be speaking at the Metropolitan Museum of okay. Art in March. And I'm going to be speaking about the sacred uh, aspect of cycladic imagery and uh, working in one room with the sculptures and their physicality. Um, I still have my wonderful solo exhibit in Salzburg. Um, 40 years of work, 350 works. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, that's been amazing. And of course, I'm always writing and doing lectures and interviews. Oh, the work on what's on my printer right now is a whole field of uh, dead bodies from um, a secret place where the bodies were just hundreds of men naked, tortured, starved oh, outside of Syria, somewhere in Syria. Um, I'm working, I'm blowing them up, I'm permutating them, I'm printing them in juxtaposition with 
uh, years of strange little animal bones and fragments my cats have brought in. Uh, so my work is not explicitly didactic. I don't quite know where this is going, but this is what I'm concerned with. And of course, I've been working with the destruction of Palestinian culture for about 20 years, and that's uh, an endless grief and source of suppressed imagery also. Right, that sounds like you're working on a, you know, a range of, of very uh, active and, and politically charged uh, material there, so it'd be really wonderful to see your, your final um, you know, work when it comes out. Um, and Carolee, again, you know, thank you so much for, for being involved and having your voice at this event is really important to us, um, you know, just having one of the few females who was involved and who's, you know, shown that activism throughout your career. So it's a real honour for us to have you uh, tonight in the room and uh, answering some questions as well later on. So um, thank you okay. so much, Carolee. Really lovely to see you.